Good evening. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jennifer Rittner, and I am the interim chair of design, research, writing, and criticism here at SVA. We are an intensive one-year MA program that examines design in all its contexts and consequences. So we are, of course, thrilled to host this talk tonight with TK Nakagaki and Stephen Heller, who is um, a founding faculty of our department, where he still teaches a master seminar in design, research, and writing. But I'm actually not here to introduce Stephen and TK um, and Quito, one of our alum, will do that. I'm actually just here to give you a little two minute pitch about our program because this talk tonight really demonstrates the importance of design-minded critical thinking in contextualizing the historical foundations of contemporary life and demonstrates that great writing catalyzes ideas and insights, giving us opportunities to engage in really meaningful, complex, and often uncomfortable dialogues about the forms, capacities, and impacts of making. So in our program, we invite students to learn from esteemed faculty like Stephen Heller and Carrie Jacobs, Leitan Modal, Robin Pograben, Alex Deleuze, how to be critical cultural theorists who ignite provocative new conversations about how design informs every facet of social life. And as many of our thesis graduates have already done, to hold up canonical and vernacular forms of making from prison garb to slave papers, from science journalism to street signage and board games and comic books, sanitation systems, that's one of our students who's looking at board games, um, and historic house interpretations, organizing systems, all of these things that are worthy of critical uh, con consideration. And not only do we hope to welcome robust, inspired pools of applicants to learn and grow with us, but we also want to invite all of you in your various professional capacities to partner with us in becoming uh, guest speakers and critics in our program. So we are hoping that you will contact us when you want to propose new courses and new fields of study for design research writing and criticism. We want you to suggest new internships and professional opportunities for our students. We ask you to attend our portfolio days and thesis presentations. Um, in the spring, and we also hope to grow a community of ethical design researchers, writers, and critics for the future, and we want you to partner with us in doing that. So, and of course, to attend events like tonight where really meaningful conversations can happen. So if you have questions or thoughts about our program, I hope that you'll contact me or any of our, uh, Eric Schwartow, who's our Director of Operations, any of our students and alum and faculty who are here tonight and wherever you meet them at SVA. Um, but tonight I'm going to uh, pass this over to Ann Quito, who uh, will tell you more about the program and introduce our guests. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I am so pleased to have a minor role in this major conversation. My name is Anne Quito. I'm a graduate of this program. I'm also a journalist. So in that vein, I thought, to get us in the mood, I might read you some of today's headlines. One, swastika drawn in snow near Syracuse among latest racist incidents on campus. Two, pencil swastika graffiti found in private parking garage. And three, High Castle producers destroyed every swastika used on the show, and the video is oh so satisfying. So it's incredible that in 2019, the appearance, the whisper, the hint of the swastika is still breaking news. Why? We have two scholars tonight who grace us with their presence, who have published two books about the topic. Um, they have similar obsessions, but they're coming from a different place. Um, I want to briefly introduce you to both of them. Um, many of you know Steve Heller as the most prolific chronicler, commentator, and champion of graphic design of our time. He has authored, co-authored, and edited, is it 193? Is that 193 books-ish on design, illustration, and related themes. Steve is the co-chair of the SVA MFA Design, designer as author, entrepreneur, and as Jennifer mentioned, a co-founder of this program. The swastika symbol beyond redemption is the third book he's written on the subject. And here is Reverend Dr. T.K. Nagaki, Nakagaki, 
is um, he is a Buddhist priest, scholar, and author of the Buddhist swastika and Hitler's cross. Let me hold it up. Rescuing a symbol of peace from the forces of hate. After studying Buddhist doctrine in Kyoto and Osaka, TK earned an MA in linguistics from Cal State Fresno and a doctorate of ministry in multi-faith studies from the New York Theological Seminary. Um, and among other things, he is also an accomplished calligrapher. Um, hopefully tonight's civil discussion will expand our minds about this incendiary symbol. Um, so here's how tonight will go. Um, first, Steve will give a, give a brief lecture on his research, um, followed by a short film. Uh, and then TK will do the same, a short lecture. Um, we segue into a conversation, and hopefully at the very end, you will have some good questions as well. Just a note, we have filmmakers here. Um, they're doing a documentary on TK. Um, so as the note here says, entry to this room means you may be on camera. Um, and they also invite you at the very end to speak to them, um, to give your thoughts on what happened tonight. Um, without further ado, would you please um, help me uh, welcome Steve Heller. Thank you. So tonight we're here to discuss this, one of the oldest symbols ever created. Whatever it's called, swastika, hooked cross, fly fought, tau, manji, gamedian, and many other uh, names, it's become associated with the Nazi party and the German nation as a symbol of evil. I brought something, and what you all see. The symbol has a long legacy and a wide diaspora. It was a sign of luck, fertility, and spirituality. Histories abound both in and out of Germany, including possibly the earliest in the US, Thomas Wilson's important 1896 Smithsonian edition that shows its widespread benign use throughout the, the continents. According to the swastika migration theory, the swastika's earliest known habitat is a territory in, at the valley of the river of Indus in India. There are various notions on how the swastika spread to Europe, but its most significant discovery was a dig in 1871 by archeologist Heinrich Schleiman in Homer's legendary city of Troy. This is a piece of pottery with the symbol that he found. Swastikas, sun wheels, and sun whirls are found in many cultures and countries, with the main similarity being the intersecting hooks, sometimes geometric and other times more freeform or curvilinear. This card was handed out to American troops to show the distinctions between the forms. Kaiser Wilhelm II, the German monarch who uh, left after World War I, was an early swastikalist. And he even wrote a book in 1934 that looked at the swastika in various directions and, represent, and one of them was representing human form. The swastika took on a mythic status. It was strongly believed that it had nothing to do with the Nazis, even as late as 1920s. It was a common printer's device, an ornamental cut. It can be found in American architectural decoration during the 19th and early 20th centuries. And this is at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. It was ubiquitous on all sorts of ephemera representing good luck and good fortune. These playing cards are aptly emblazoned with the sign. 
We'll see other examples of Indian popular culture, but this swastika fireworks was a common motif. Yes, and even Coca-Cola used the form as a novelty. And the Dakota Corn Palace added the symbol to its exterior arabesques. The Corn Palace burned down when the methane from all that corn combusted. Watch out what you do with corn. The Girls Club issued the swastika as an emblem of honor to its members and published an eponymous magazine. The Boy Scouts were not immune from its hypnotic charms either. The American Biscuit Company used the swastika as a label, and if you collected a bunch of them, you'd win a prize. <laughs> the Pacific Coast Biscuit Company copied the American Biscuit Company and also used the swastika label and went into copyright suit. Here is a deodorant where the swastika is simply part of the package design. In Santa Fe, an American Native People's Museum shows crafts that brought together and shows the swastika as a good luck sign. This icon of Ganesh is situated on the swastika. This is a temple in Indonesia. And this is a street in Koshin. Just note the address. <laughs> Sanatan Dharma, the six-pointed star, is the shape that's generally understood to consist of two triangles. We think of it as the Star of David. But one a a triangle pointed up and the other down, and it was locked in a harmonious embrace. One represented male, the other represented female. The two components are called Aum and Erm in Sanskrit and symbolize human position between sky and earth. A friend was greeted this uh, when he entered a hotel in India. He was a little shocked. There are incidental swastikas all over the world that have nothing to do with the Nazis. This is an insignia for the 45th Division, later known as the Thunderbird Division in Oklahoma. It was an American force that went into Europe during World War I. And this is the 55th Pursuit Squadron that also used a swastika in an American Air Force plane, Army Air Force. May our glorious flag and this lucky star guide and keep you wherever you are. Hitler is said to have first contact with the hacking crews the hooked cross when he was a young student at the Abbey of Lembeck am Tram in Upper Austria. At Lembeck, he saw the swastika engraved on the four corners of the monastery, where it had been sculpted several years earlier pursuant to orders of the abbot Theodoric Hagen. Wilhelm Defke was not an ideological Nazi. He was a graphic designer. But in the struggle of signs in the Weimar Republic, in the Journal of History, Volume 13, Sherwin Simon cites and documents uh, this logo that he did when he was at the Magdeburg School in Germany, where he taught. Uh, he joined the party and argued for modernism's modern designs linked to Nazi policy on account of the policy the party's technological sophistication and opposition to narrow provincialism. As you can see, his logos are very streamlined and very rectilinear. Uh, there's an apocryphal story that, from his assistant that uh, the Nazis took his version of the sign and used it and never paid him for it. Another crime against humanity. <laughs> This is the ABCs of National Socialism. Hitler adopted the symbol for a variety of reasons and ultimately saw to it that it was used efficiently and powerfully as the brand of his fledgling party. Here are different flags and banners that were used and shown in the ABC book. Here's the SA with flags. 
the sign flags and armbands tied to the populace together as a single nationalist system. Here are young girls all looking to the swastika and looking to their leader as one. Boris Artsebashev, who was a Russian-born American illustrator, uh, saw the swastika as ripe for satire. It is used today in many different ways, it's, and very strange ways throughout the world. This is a food shop in Indonesia, Hitler's Cross. Irredeemable is uh, what I called the first edition of this book. The question was, is the swastika irredeemable question mark? Uh, as long as these things happen, there is no irredeemability for it for it. The purpose of my book is not to cast doubt on the millions who do not see the swastika in an evil light, but the millions who suffered and continue to be tormented by the symbol and its affinities. And these are some of those hate group affinities that are in use today. So these are my two books on the subject, the one that we're talking about tonight and Iron Fists Branding the 20th Century Totalitarian State. That's my little introduction. We're going to show a little bit of the film that's being done uh, on the swastika, which follows TK around uh, talking about this with various people and talking about his own philosophy. My name is uh, Toshikazu Kenjitsu Nakagaki, so people call me TK as a you know initial part. And uh, I myself was uh, born in Japan, uh, in Osaka, and I came to the United States 1985. So um, actually, I lived here about 35 years in this country, United States. Uh, right now, uh, it seems like uh, in terms of uh, swastika or you know the Hakenkreuz, we just need a little more information available so that people can read and see. Ichojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojojoj
Symbols require us to be careful. And hate crimes here in the city have uh, increased immeasurably in the last couple of years, and now the swastika is being painted in all kinds of places. So I think it's important, uh, particularly for Buddhists and, and perhaps uh, more generally for many Asians, to understand what a provocative and negative symbol it is uh, when used as part of white supremacy, white nationalism, anti-Semitism. It was used as a trademark, or at least a supplementary mark, for many products because in history it represented good fortune, good luck, the four seasons, uh, any number of more deeply s symbolic and or spiritual things. But to try and convince people who still are bearing the scars of that use of swastika, because whether Hitler called it that or not, if the last thing the person you love most in the world experienced was a person wearing that symbol, blowing their brains out, what they called it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. To them, it doesn't matter. And that, no, there's no maybe. That's the problem here. If in the end, historical reconstruction ま、ずっとヘイトクライムをどうやってできてるかもよくわかると思うんですよ。Uh, good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me all right. <coughs> My voice is a little weak. I just Actually, I, I, I just got back from Japan last night, <laughs> and, then, and then also half jet lag, but also, which means sometimes I lose my voice. Although, yeah, I have pretty nice voice, I guess, but <laughs> today, today you may be experiencing something different. But first of all, I just wanted to mention, these are a book that she showed, so I just put something, and he, she introduced already about my background, so I'm gonna skip those things. And um, so maybe I start from here. Uh, one of the reasons why I started to do my book is the uh, difference between those two. Because uh, I was born in Japan, raised in Japan, you know, the swastika is always like this, quiet, you know, the peaceful, the, you know, the represent the Buddhist temple, and or Buddha, or Buddha's mind. Nothing to do with, uh, you know, against, you know, hate, or against all the, you know, the violence. So that's the symbol of the swastika. So only the Buddha can have the swastika in a, the heart of the, the you know, the, the body. Nobody else, even bodhisattvas, they can carry the swastika on their hands, but not, not here. And so it's the uh, symbol of uh, kind of a light. And, but, uh, so these are some of the understanding that I have. It's just quotation from the Buddhist scriptures. You know, among the Buddhist scriptures, there is the description, uh, like uh, this is the, uh, some of them, it doesn't many, but I just pick up uh, just for today. Uh, so, that, so you can read it, but at that time, the Tathagata, the Buddha, exposed the uh, treasure-like light from the swastika or swastika, the same one, on, on his chest. That the light has 100,000 colors and illuminates all the Buddha's world uh, spread like the uh, particles throughout 10 quarters. It's one of the sutras. And then the other one from the swastika diamond-like adornments in his heart, uh, the Buddha spread the great bright lights like those. And there are many examples like those things. And so it is definitely the, the, I mean, this is about 2,000 years, over 2,000 years anyway, in Asia, all over the place. But it's not just for the Buddhism, but also there's a Hindu-Jewish uh, leadership uh, summit, it was held in uh, Jerusalem, 
and 2008. So there is this, some parts of understanding. Here is, you can see the Hindus, how the Hindus see the swastika. And uh, swastika is an ancient and uh, greatly auspicious symbol of the Hindu tradition. And it is inscribed on uh, Hindu temples, rule, uh, ritual altars, entrances, and even uh, account books. And um, at the citation, I mean, sorry, I have to change my glasses, but sorry, <laughs> you can read it. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's get, I, I look young, but sometimes that doesn't tell the <laughs> why do I have to change my glasses is because of the age too. Um, the sort of version of this uh, sacred symbol was misappropriated by the Third Reich in Germany and abused as the emblem under which uh, heinous crimes were uh, per perpetuated against the humanity, particularly the Jewish people. The participants recognized that this symbol is and has been sacred to Hindus for uh, millennia, long before its misappropriation. So anyway, these are some of the quotes that I have, but also, um, so that's the kind of image that I have. And, but then I came to the United States 1990, sorry, 1985 for the first time. And then I just had uh, some experience at the temple because uh, we make, I was making the flower shrine of the Buddha. And then the, you know, I put the, all the flowers. It's the birthday of the Buddha. So, but in Japan, what I did was uh, normally after I put the flower shrine, we just put the, what do you call it, uh, you know, swastika symbol with a flower like a croissant so, but then the you know, members came and they said, oh, you can't do this here. <laughs> and then so that was the first encountering for me because you know, there's no idea at that time. Well, actually we do have an idea, but we, in, in Japan we have a two different words. For the, you know, swastika is manji in Japanese, hakenkreutz, which is a Hitler's words, uh, which is you know, hakenkreutz. <laughs> so there's a two different things, totally. And then it is a different things, actually, originally, too. Uh, Hakenkreutz is, of course, it's a cross. So that's why anti-Semitism is the long history of the cross with the 2,000 years. So that, that's what the cross is about for the swastika. But then the part of the Buddhist tradition and Hindu others, <laughs> that's before the Christ. Nothing to do with the Christ. So nothing to do with anti-Semitism either. And so now the problem, what happened is after <laughs> I came to the United States, and so after that incident, I learned, you know, difficult to, for the Jewish people to see those signs. So that's why uh, we said, oh, maybe I shouldn't use it anymore. So I didn't use for swast the swastika symbol 25 years, actually. And then I told people, if they use it, you, you should probably think of the other people's suffering. And then so maybe you shouldn't use that symbol. But then recently, 2009, I believe, and when we had an interface gathering, we have a, you know, the, like 100 religious leaders gather. And uh, also uh, we have a guest, like, uh, you know, so-called expert, and if, who came and then talked about swastika because it's a hate crime. But what he said actually turned, <laughs> changed my mind, meaning he said, this swastika is a universal symbol of evil. Now, if he said this is a symbol of the West, this is what it is, then I don't have to say anything. But when you say universal symbol, that's a different, totally different meaning. And I asked the question to this expert. He said, I, well, he doesn't know anything about the swastika, the Buddhism, you know, Hinduism, you know, all the other Asians or Native Americans too because we've been using it, and then now he says universal symbol of evil. This is totally something is wrong with the education, probably, the, the way that was uh, treated. And so this, then if, or, you know, it was control education, I guess. Swastika has to be evil. And even Hitler didn't say swastika anyway, but yet he used the word swastika. So, so there are many, many things I start you know, realizing that we need uh, some kind of uh, material that we can provide that we can discuss. Right now, that, uh, right now I mean, of course, we have a book now. So that's why we can start the discussion. But before, we don't have any books like those. So that's what, what so even like uh, Hitler's, 
Hitler always used the Hakenkreuz, that's a German language, the hooked cross. And the swastika means su as a good, and then the good uh, uh, plus, you know, to be. So it's a stage of goodness. And uh, these are interesting example. So when you translate, hook, you know, Hakenkreuz has hooked cross, you can clearly see what the cross is about. This swastika, well, it's not a swastika, it's a hooked cross is about. And so uh, anyway, I think it's time is running, so I'm going to finish. The, so my point is basically awareness. The, the reason why I write this book is uh, having awareness of the you know, people, you know, knowing the truth, not just uh, one-sided truth. And the education also you know, need necessary to learn all those other parts. And then the dialogues, what, like this one, open dialogue about this particular symbol. And then maybe mutual understanding may be coming up out of it. So th those are my purpose of this book. So I thank you very much. Yes. First of all, um, I've had the pleasure of reading both books. And I have to tell you, it's quite challenging to read them on the subway. <laughs> um, this one has a double swastika, and I've gotten a lot of scowls, and this one is wonderfully illustrated, but also hints at it. I wonder if you've had the same plight, either of your discussions on this book cover. Well, I've, uh, when the first edition came out, Mirko Illich, who designed the first book in the cover, and, and this book as well, uh, in the first book, he split the swastika in half. So there was, the bottom part was on the top, and the top part was on the bottom. Uh, but you could still read the swastika. I had to read it inside a copy of Playboy. <laughs> <laughs> so that I wouldn't be embarrassed by it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's always been a, uh, a problem. I gave it to... Uh, uh, the woman who wrote No Logo. Oh, no, Naomi Klein. Naomi Klein. And she said she was reading it on the airplane and uh, got dirty looks from the stewardesses. So it's a symbol that still sends neural messages. It's true. Whatever it's called, it sends neural messages. It's true. What about you? Yeah, the same words. You use two, not one, but two. I, yeah, actually, I, I have in. In Japan, you know, I have Japanese book, and then here the other one, so I English one. So, yes. yeah, in Japan, nobody pay attention to, first of all. So mm -hmm. everything is fine with just no reaction or anything. There's just one of the book, they're reading it. So, uh, so that's, but then if you read the open this book in Japan, you know, here, uh, there's, uh, because I, actually I did at the police department gathering, so the, the, I know that they call me later. <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're really annoyed or they're really upset about what I brought the book, but I just brought the book, but so. Mm. So <laughs> also the library and so forth, when I, you know, when I research it, because a librarian seems kind of uh, the face that you can, because I try to read a Mein Kampf, but then the, you know, they just, the, because I have different translations from the Mein Kampf also ask, then why am I you know, doing the study for the Mein Kampf? Uh, mein Kampf, you know, the Hitler's uh, right book. So, so those are some of the experience that I can't. But you're sticking with the cover. Oh, this is not. Oh, this is not my design. Anyway. <laughs> okay. It's a publisher's design, by the ah. way. This is so. My design was different. We have to look that up at yeah. some point. Okay. I have a question no. for Steve. Um, you describe um, your interest in the swastika as an obsession, and you've written three books on it. But this one, I noticed something in the introduction where you you revise your earlier opinions. If I might read, read it, it's sure. sort of well, sort of clearly put. You say, I have written articles about serious attempts at reclamation and rehabilitation. Initially, I was sympathetic. However, as long as the Nazi iteration continues to elicit destructive power, there is no way it will ever be redeemed. And I mean never. 2019. Right. And I mean that for, for the West. Mm. Uh, I, 
understand that it is a symbol, a, a spiritual symbol, uh, but it has, and, and TK and I have argued about this. I say it's been hijacked. He says it's not the swastika. I think it's semantics. Uh, the fact is it was hijacked, whether they called it that or not. It ultimately is called that in the New York Times and elsewhere during the period of time when it was first unfurled. And uh, so as long as it has that, that meaning, as long as that has not been uh, reclaimed by somebody in authority or some place in authority, uh, it's forever tainted. And uh, you know, it's interesting that headline you read about uh, men in the high castle, them burning the swastikas. Uh, you may remember in the second or third season, they filled an entire subway car with advertising for that show and they used the swastika mm -hmm. and they had to take it down. Mm -hmm. So even though the swastika is a symbol that actually sells books, when I started out, there were two things that sold books the color red, and a swastika. Golly, here it is. Uh, so. so this book is not sold out of class. <laughs> Yet. It doesn't have a great plot, but it is a good book. Um, we've heard a lot of rational arguments just from the premise. It strikes me that as this topic is really, there's a really large emotional component to it. Um, I wonder, Steve, if you can talk about how you feel every time you see a swastika and what you think of. Well, every time I see a swastika, there are two feelings that I have. One is I remember my grandmother showing me a postcard that she got from her father who was stuck in the Woj ghetto and probably was murdered either in Woj or on the way to Auschwitz. It was stamped with symbols of Grosse Deutschland, which were the eagle and the swastika. So I feel that uh, a sense of loss. She never talked to me about it. She never, never mentioned the Holocaust at all. Uh, the other feeling I get is a certain voyeuristic uh, excitement because, uh, and I was talking to Jennifer about this earlier, uh, it's like watching a train wreck. I can't get enough of books about or films on uh, what went on during that period under this symbol. I, the photographs of daily life in Nazi Germany just floor me, uh, whether it's, uh, uh, the sense that I can't believe it, it actually happened, or the sense that it was so powerful that from a design standpoint, uh, it made such an impact amongst the people uh, in that and occupied countries. So the obsession is twofold. There's the fetishistic one, and then there's the emotional one. Mm. Okay, how do you feel when you um, hear that people saying it's a universal symbol of hope, of hate. And I wonder if you have a personal connection beyond your doctoral thesis. Oh, okay. Uh, first of all, uh, be before I do the uh, dissertation, yes. so I went to the, you know, Auschwitz and mm. also Treblinka, and then, uh, uh, well, the, then the uh, Sackenhausen and one in uh, uh, the Netherlands also, the, you know, but, but then the one thing I went to see because, you know, whether I should continue to this, you know, the study, uh, because that, that symbol itself is such a big connotation here in, the, in this country. But then the, when I went and I just paid respect, you know, as a Buddhist monk, so I just put the incense and do a little prayer for the different places, and I went to the uh, many yeah, graveyard as well. Mm. And um, but then what I felt at that time was uh, slightly different. The swastika is also buried with the uh, uh, Jewish people because it was uh, it was sad to see actually for me the swastika is used 
the way that you know kill people is supposed to be much more bring the light instead of you know the darkness. The swastika, as you, I show it, that's a the su as a happiness. It's, it's supposed to bring the happiness, not you know the unfortunate hap, you know the sadness and killing people. And so I felt the you know by, by Hitler did was they bury the swastika as well with the peoples you know with the Jewish people for me. So that was my feeling, because yeah. So that's the that's why I decided to write this book too, because maybe I mean this is just a strange feeling that I had at that time was maybe if the swastika come back again with a real light, then the maybe Jewish people who ever kill under the swastika maybe you know the liberated again. I mean it was kind of weird <laughs> maybe from the religious point. I think it's something. You know, the darkness is there, but then the darkness could be also, you know, uh, bring the light. Little light can open up. Because one thing that I feel, uh, I was talking with the uh, uh, chief rabbi of Poland, uh, Michael Shudley, uh, before, and so he suggested actually <laughs> go to the maybe, uh, you know, Auschwitz. And also, if I can bring the good meaning of swastika somewhere, even like 1% from the Right now, it's a totally darkness, like 100% evil. But if we realize, if we can have a little opening, like a 1% or 2%, you know, light, then that would be very successful for me. And then because the big, big difference between just total darkness and then a little bit light, mm -hmm. and then hope, hope that little bit light, because I, one of the images that I have is, you know, swastika is a little, you know, 45 degree. So what I might try to do is I try to turn back to this way. This is the original swastika, which is the all the to, to, total light comes. Mm -hmm. Right now, because of the darkness, you know, there's no lights come at all. But when I turn, maybe I should be able to bring, well, I don't know I should be able to or not, but then that, that's the kind of feeling that I have. So I just wanted to contribute a, even a little bit of the, uh, you know, open that I, if I can do. So that's the efforts that I'd like to do. So basically, I, for my strategy or my <laughs> promise is always, if everybody, if somebody say you can't do it, I should be able to do it. <laughs> that, that's my my feeling. Never means I, I, there should be the way to do something. So I I feel like th there should be the way to uh, transform again. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was if my view. You don't mind me probing. You have such an affable character around mm -hmm. you. Is there a part of you that's also angry? It seems like your oh. um, you are. It seems yeah, like I'm, your I'm, argument sort of stem, kind of it sort of describes this Western sort of um, Western claim to a symbol that's mm -hmm. ancient to you. Is is there does that anger you too? Oh, no, I don't angry about uh, un what happens to here uh, in one way mm. because that's what happens. So it's not anger or <laughs> likes and dislikes, this mm. is what's happening. But the things that I feel is uh, because normally, you know, those evil things could be done because of the ignorance also. Mm. So for me, this is a book for bring that uh, clear the ignorance so that we can have a light. Let me put that in context. I, they, you mm. hinted at it in the clip. You visited the um, people who make maps in Japan. As you may right. know, Buddhist temples are denoted by uh, the mirror mm -hmm. swastika, right? And there is a move for the 2020 Olympics to eliminate this symbol in, in, in favor of a building, right. right? To sort of like kind of not shock the Western visitors. How do you feel about that? Well, actually, I wrote the letter to them. Yes. Now they're not changing. Mm. Because uh, I think sometimes, because in a way, it's like uh, everything is European, Yolo, Yolo center. <laughs> things are uh, involved here too. Everything's Yolo is right, and then the other parts is wrong, mm. maybe. Because that this is one of the other reasons that I wanted to strongly at uh, this time. You know, swastika has been because of the years, like uh, two thousand years, or three thousand years, five thousand years, mm. possibly. It's a long period. So, which is a uh, history of humanity is there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so wh why do you have to destroy? Because of the only 100 years of the Hitler's mm -hmm. act can destroy this. It's like kind of sad to see that why Hitler's has more powerful than the, the symbol of the, the sun. 
or symbol of the light. Mm. And uh, so, so for me, that's the kind of challenge to the Hitler. I'm not challenged to you know, Jewish people or anybody, but rather to the Hitlers why you use this way is totally wrong. And then so I wanted to separate from that. Right now, hit, you know, swastika or Hakenkreuz is equal to you know, the Hitler. But then I guess we could have a little more uh, you know, the weaker the power of the Hitra, so that we could have a little more uh, to be able to see the swastika, not in a biased way, but also because of this particular swastika itself, which bring the people's liberation and help a lot of people, bring the comfort, and so so that that aspect should be also emphasized. And uh, what was the question? That my jet lag is calling me, but no. <laughs> I hope I'm answering okay. Does that linguistic separation allay it for you? No, it? the linguistic separation, which I've thought about a lot since I met TK, and I tend to, you know, I'm a liberal. I tend to uh, lean backwards to understand, and, and I read TK's book with great interest. Uh, but linguistics, uh, words, particularly in Nazi Germany, were ways of obfuscating reality. Uh, you know, uh, resettlement was uh, was execution, was uh, annihilation. Uh, so, you know, what the Japanese decide to do in terms of the Olympics, that's a commercial decision. Mm. It's not a philosophical decision. Mm. Um, what we do here in this country is, and particularly in the the Trump age is we reinforce and enable white supremacy, which has never gone away from the founding f of the country to now, uh, by allowing certain symbols to exist. Uh, when I talk about the swastika, I also include all those other symbols that either were influenced by or have a, an, a, a sense sense of uh, the swastika. You know, for me, the cross is an interesting concept. For some, it means total redemption and resurrection. And for others, it means cruelty and uh, conquer, you know, violence, conquering. Uh, it depends on who's wearing it and where it's being worn. Uh, but as, as the priest in, in the film said, you know, it's blood for the Japanese and it's symbol for the Americans. And if we can't even arbitrarily say this symbol is bad and should never exist in our borders, mm -hmm. that's perfectly fine with me. I'm not a free speech absolutist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when it comes to certain things, because time is going to wipe away so much. Uh, we, we need to retain certain mnemonics. Mm. Yes, of course. Um, yeah, also, f but at the same time, United States nowadays is much more diverse. So diverse means you have, you have uh, people from Asia, and you're not only, you know, uh, the so-called Caucasian, you know, the, the one of the race. So there are many, many races and many people coming. And then the putting down one symbol, which is very, very important symbol for the Asia, means you're putting down all the Asian people. And, uh, you know, it, this is one of the symbol, even like a, this is sad to know, the interface gathering, this is the most interface symbol ever probably existed in the world. But because of the, the tendency of the this particular idea of the e Nazis equal to the Hitlers, or, you know, the, I mean, sorry, swastika equal to the Hitlers. So because of that, we can't even use it, this particular symbol. Although, you know, like, again, Hindu, Buddhist, Jain, you know, many, many places we have been using this symbol, but then the, it is always sad to think, see those things happen. So for me, this is another challenge to uh, bring the, a little awareness, and I'm, I'm not, you know, my plan is like, not, it's not like my lifetime, maybe, you know, maybe another 100 years, then will be changed or something. There was a, <laughs> a, a guy in Canada named Man Woman, 
and he ran something called the Friends of the Swastika. Mm. And I got to talking to him, and you know, he, like TK, he's a in, very intelligent, very caring uh, human being, and was making some wonderful points. And the points are all valid, but as I say, there's a, a moment where even validity doesn't stand up to scrutiny, where, you know, it becomes kind of like a catechism. You just believe it because you have to believe it. Steve, I have a question. So we're having this conversation here in this context. Do you think this dialogue will be different in, if we were in Japan? Oh, of course. First of all, we'd be speaking Japanese. Well, yes. <laughs> Uh, second of all, I'd be eating a lot better. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's, it w would be a very different conversation. Uh, even though during the war, the Japanese were allies, uh, and the two flags hung together at times to show their allegiance, there, were, there was also the manji that existed uh, on paper, on uh, on walls and stuff like that, where you would get confused. And, and that's the slide that I showed uh, of the U.S. Army. I mean, the Army would o actually would send around a lot of interesting propaganda to its soldiers so that they had some sense that there was the enemy and there was the innocent. Mm. Uh, just a as a quick aside, the first letter I got for the book when it first came out was from a Native American. Native American had gone to SVA and he had heard that I was doing the book and he wrote me a letter before it came out saying, I'm so glad you're doing the book because now you'll look at the symbol as for what it is. Mm -hmm. Then he sent me the letter after the book came out and basically said, screw you. <laughs> uh, you're a cultural colonialist. Mm -hmm. And I admit to being a cultural colonialist. Uh, you know, at the same time, you can read all sorts of accounts of where the symbol was just wiped off, mm. you know, from, there was a town in Canada called Swastika, they didn't change that name, but at the same time, I quote the New York Times in my book that uh, Indian tribes in the Southwest burned all their swastika memorabilia, or mm -hmm. memorabilia That's is the wrong word. Um, TK, like, again, to that question, we're having this conversation here. Do you sometimes feel you're alone in this side? Oh, you, not really. No, no, <laughs> Why? Okay. <laughs> because, you know. Yes, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. And then, the, well, the thing is also some of the religious leaders, some people are very uh, open about this particular one because it's just a part of the education that I try to do. I'm not convinced one or the others. Mm -hmm. I just basically what, you, what I try to do is you need the fact to no, I mean, if right now, there's no discussion anyway, because this is only, you know, everything, what, because sometimes I heard the comments like, whatever I said, it doesn't matter. So what does that mean is the people who have already educated this way, emotionally this way, then you can't change. Well, I mean, Buddhism, talking about everything changed, nothing remains without change. So everything is changed. If you can't change, something is not correct, <laughs> because interdependence origination and so forth. So that's why, in a way, things change. Uh, it's almost impossible. And I also, one of the reasons I feel like it's, uh, what's, how you, uh, I, pronunciation is no good. The rabbi. Uh, rabbi Nachman. Rabbi Nachman. Uh -huh. So I, I, I actually enjoy his quotes. And especially the last, I mean, I quote many of those, him, but then he's given me a lot of encouragement because it's, I just have many of them, but uh, there's an introduction of my book too. Uh, but then one that it says, if you believe that you can damage, then believe that you can fix. If you believe that you can harm, then believe that you can heal. And I decide to believe this statement. <laughs> okay. So because it damaged by the people, now you should 
probably fix it because once you steal it, and this is just a moral things, you know, if uh, he, if or Hitler took it or the symbol from the East Asia and so forth, so he damaged it. So then after that, Europe supposed to do is clean up all the symbols and return as it is was before. But now, what the other way is saying, because they brought it, and then now it's, they start saying, oh, you, you have to change your symbol because uh, you know, you, uh, this is a symbol of the evil. So why the Japan or other Eastern country have, are using this? You have to change it. That, that's what the attitude I feel, which is totally, for me, uh, morally wrong. And uh, so, so that's why you know, uh, <laughs> this is another challenge for me, that what are you going to do? You, you, you take it, and then so you just return with a way that uh, uh, Japanese side is different. We just receive something. We just give back more nice one. <laughs> <laughs> Not just you know, just give, give you back, but also maybe I have another present for you. Mm -hmm. So that's the way it should be. <laughs> well, but anyway, whether it works or not, I don't know. But, you know. I have a last question, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. To both of you, um, do you think banning or talking about or discussing the Hakin Kreuz or the swastika actually gives it power? talking about give the power to food. Yeah, like if we ban it, like swastika and I guess oh, Adolf ban. Hitler. And on the flip side, what do you think of efforts to make light of the symbol? I was just watching Jojo Rabbit this weekend, and it's described as an anti-hate satire. What do you think that does to this conversation? I didn't watch that one. So okay. Yeah, no, but I, I interviewed the author of the novel oh. that it's based on. and. Uh, the movie is nothing like the novel, by the way. Um, you know, there's a, there's a thought, and it takes many forms, that if you make something that's dark light, as you were talking about, you can change it. You can r redeem it. Um, and, you know, there's something good to be said about redemption. And then there's something uh, dangerous about redemption and forgiveness. You know, it's great to have the, the spiritual strength to forgive, uh, even if you don't forget. But there are times when forgiveness can be a, uh, a retreat from your own moral position. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to get into heavy too heavy a dialogue about it, but I, I wrote the book the first time in part because I was obsessed with the sign and symbol, but also because as a graphic designer, uh, I realized that so many different symbols uh, have multiple meanings, mm -hmm. and particularly commercial symbols. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, Tylenol gets a few bottles with poison in it, and they've got to take it off the, uh, the shelves. The Gap changes their logo, and people get crazy about it. Turn back. You know, symbolism is a really powerful uh, art, craft, and phenomena. And to me, ultimately, whatever happens to the swastika, and I'm sure it's going to, at some point, lose its negative qualities. Mm -hmm. It's, it's bound to as the generations proceed. But symbolism is still a, an issue, certainly with many of us who come out of the design world that needs to be addressed, and this is a good, a good way to address it. Thank you. Uh, uh, for me, it's, it's not, I'm not talking about really redemption, but rather, I mean, sim, this sim, I mean, understanding only, really, meaning like, you know, it doesn't have to be, one symbol could be yes or no. I mean, it could be both. That's, that's basically, you know, if it's the use in Nazi Germany, yeah, of course, they are used for the, uh, another reasons. Of course, that's a Christ reason, right? The crusade reasons to kill others. And uh, so, but those things are never be discussed really much also. So I hope this book will bring some more, you know, the how you 
kill other people. I mean, I mean, <laughs> like uh, how you create the war is a uh, you know one ju two just are always fighting each other or something like those. And so there's a nature of that too is uh, what I would like to out come out of this particular book. But also there's the uh, sense for me is a difference between East and West too. Because for me, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be yes or no. It, it could be yes and no and no. Or yes, you know, it's like a, here is a very interesting, you know, building that we are living here. Because when you come in, the this street, your flag is a blue, and then across the street, the other building is flag is uh, red. Orange. Is it orange? Oh, red okay. Red orange. Yeah, it's like uh, United States, I, I, but then <laughs> red and you know. They got Oh, is that right? But then the one is a blue and the one is a red. <laughs> but anyway, that kind of, kind of has to be one or the others. But then the part of the Buddhist or Eastern way of having the conversation uh, you know, or something is like uh, both can be exist. And then, but uh, it's like, it's like a purple. <laughs> so I'm searching for the purple, not mm. right or wrong, reframe or not reframe, but it, it is just the way that was. So that's why we just accept whatever the situation of the things happens. So that, that's my approach, nothing to do. I mean, if it naturally disappears, it's fine. If it doesn't disappear, it's fine too. Mm. So that, that's what, how my <laughs> part of the philosophy goes. I wish I could be like you. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it just reminds me of uh, another symbol. The Japanese flag is probably the most beautiful flag in the world. Uh, so simple, so uh, austere, yet full of energy. And the Japanese battle flag is actually quite a beautiful flag. Uh, during World War II, these were as toxic as anything could be. Uh, the battle flag may still be toxic to those who fought in the war. Uh, it's probably neutral to most people. Uh, and the Japanese flag itself, I think most people wouldn't even relate it to any of the things that happened during the war. That's always, and uh, as you know, history goes the other way too. If you're living in a country like Japan, then that doesn't mean the other, that's it become an opposite. You know, the war right, system. If you're in the United States, enemy is the other one. If you're, the, if you're in, a, in a part of the enemy country, enemy is you. Mm. Right, so it's that it doesn't say that's an so evil and so forth either. Actually, all the human beings is uh, like like that. The stupidity for me that just this is the right you know mm -hmm. things that we do. The other people think that's the right thing, so th that's why they fight. I mean, they never have a war. <laughs> I, I'm doing wrong. <laughs> You're not gonna really fight with it, probably. Or sometimes they do, you know, uh, for the name or for the you know for their to, to yeah. Paraphrase. I saw the enemy and it is me. <laughs> and then, well, yeah, well actually, the, in, in the part of the Buddhist, for me, is a very important is the we are not perfect either. Mm. I mean, so I have, you know, as you said, ang anger, as I said, anger, so, you know, greed and so forth. But yet, you know, we do have the other way too. So, you know, the, because everybody, I don't, you know, the, the human beings is, is not 100% evil or 100% you know, the good, <laughs> but has some part is good, some part is not good. Mm. That's why we listen to each other, mm. right? I, if I know everything, I don't have to listen to you <laughs> or something like that. And if you know everything, I, you don't have to listen to me. But since we don't have everything, you know, maybe we may, we may think we have everything, but we're not really perfect, so that's why we wanted to listen to. And then maybe the voice uh, lesson that we learned from the, the World War II. I mean, so many people are killed, and then even like, uh, but that the, the reflection is very important for me. It's not who is winning and who is losing. Uh, right now, the problem might be, you know, who's on the UN, you know, like a nuclear weapons that I'm talking, you know, that he, he, you know, because why do we need, because all, some of the countries which won the war during World, World War II, they wanted to keep the uh, nuclear weapons for, so like those things are uh, all related. <laughs> 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 
I think this is, uh, we have time for one or two questions before we adjourn. Yes, ma'am. fixing as softening a symbol of hate mm -hmm. and a symbol of genocide. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the way you fix is to remember and to, yeah. act, to mm -hmm. take it mm -hmm. for what it means now because in my world when something is broken mm -hmm. it doesn't get fixed. You know, I break a glass, I can't fix it. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's, I, I apologize for not really having a question but I would you like to respond? Well, well, I appreciate uh, any comments actually for me too, because uh, I just wanted to share my thoughts and uh, so that I can hear your thoughts and your honest opinions. So I really appreciate uh, things. So because that that that's why I, 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 I since I wrote this book, it's not because of you know I wanted to make people quiet, but rather wanted to have more response so that we have more you know dialogue type of thing so that we learn each other and what what really means. And then the life, I guess, especially wars and everything is so not that simple, I don't think. So there's no answer for that either. So I thank you so much. We have one more question in the back, sir. I don't have a question, but just a thought that, you know, uh, if you go back to the propaganda cartoon of World War II, mm -hmm. uh, and it's done back in Bugs Bunny versus the Nazis, and uh, I think it's uh, Daffy Duck and the Japanese, what's fascinating about them is that the people making the cartoons have no understanding of Japan whatsoever. Mm -hmm. all, the, all the propaganda World War II cartoons were incredibly racist yeah. uh, and had no real substance to them. And yet the people working on the German cartoons did understand. We had Germans living with us. It was not something that was that alien to us back then. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons perhaps the swastika has become such an onerous thing here in the United States is it was presented to us by somebody we understood. The Germans and, you know, we... In the 1920s and 30s, we were all living together here in America, and the Germans took on this other persona and created a symbol that, look, your designer, the swastika is a brilliant graphic design. It burns yourself, itself into your eyes, and you see it. But it was first presented to us, quotes, Western civilization, as connected to something evil. You know, I think we just need a couple of centuries of people not using it anymore to have it revert back. To uh, TK's thing, but I think that's maybe part of the cultural difference here is the actual continental difference. We understood the Germans, the Japanese were like they're all different than us. You know, they don't even eat the same food. You know, yeah, that's true. I think it's part so of where, where I, I see the struggle the two of you are working with here is kind of the Western versus the Eastern understanding. Even the TK is like this just is the way it is. It's not right or wrong. But there's so much in the Western. It's got to be number one, top number one. We got to be the best. It's got to be. So I think this is whole. Cultural difference that you guys mm -hmm. are, maybe yeah. a couple thousand years you can work it out. <laughs> 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 we're working, try to work you know, now. There was a, uh, a, a German American Bund in the United States, and there were th over three million members, and many of them were located in uh, Yorkville, in New York. And they traveled with, in pr parades and marches, and went to summer camps in Yapank, Long Island, and other places. Uh, and their message was, the swastika represents our new nation. And it was allowed. Uh, but then they found out that that new nation was persecuting groups of people and ultimately killing those people. And I think that that certainly had something to do with our indelible uh, memory yeah. and 
You know, I, I have found, or used to find, I'd go up to Yorkville when I was tw in my 20s, and I'd find Nazi paraphernalia, you know, stickers and things. And I'm beginning to find more of that now. So... Uh, Is that worrying? Is that worrisome? It's very worrisome. Uh, you know, it's like we don't... You know, one of the things that TK is saying, we have to have understanding. Well, I think understanding can be weaponized. Mm -hmm. And right now, we're with all of this reactivity. With Stephen Miller, uh, you know, it's history it may not be repeating itself to the full extent, but it hasn't gone away. And that's depressing. Okay. Maybe that's a sober note to end this evening. <laughs> but before we end. Yes. Can I just say one thing? Because I think we need to be right. To the lady about the Japanese not understanding and not having different. When we understood Southern flag, how long it took us to understand the meaning of that? Let's not point fingers at that. Uh, Mirko is, uh, has put together an exhibition that's been traveling around the world on tolerance. And it's uh, gone to 38 countries. Uh, but what I wanted to say is that I'm giving away eight or nine copies that's of this right. book. And uh, <laughs> under eight or nine people's chairs is a piece of paper. <laughs> So if you look under your chair and you find the paper. All right, that's a more joyful way to end. Um, there are drinks and cheese outside. Um, thank you for being here. If you could please give TK and Steve a round of applause. And books as well. <laughs>